What makes life interesting is we don't know how it's going to work out. I think we do know we're flirting with serious trouble. I think we also know that some of our earlier fears were, were overblown. Our old school Ben Graham valuation methods dead. They'll never die. You can't. The idea of getting more value than you pay for, that's what investment is. If you want to be successful, you have to get more value than you pay for. And so it's never going to be obsolete. Now, you can get a whole body of people that don't even know what they're buying. They're just, they're just quote quotations on the ticker. Think of the past crazy booms and how they worked out. The South Seas bubble, the bubble in the late 20s, so on and so on. We've had this since the dawn of capitalism. We've had crazy bubbles. What are your current thoughts on the inflationary environment? And please compare and contrast it to the 1970s. When Volcker, after the 70s, took the prime rate to 20 percent and the government was paying 15 percent on its government bonds, that was a horrible recession. Lasted a long time, caused a lot of ag agony. And I certainly hope we're, never, we're not going there again. I think the I think conditions that allowed Volcker to do that without an interference from the pol politicians were very unusual. And I think in, in 2020 hindsight, it was a good thing that he did it. I would not predict that our modern politicians will be as willing to permit a new Volcker to get that tough with the economy and bring on that kind of a recession. So I think the new troubles are likely to be different from the old troubles. We've done something pretty extreme. And we don't know how bad the troubles will be, you know, whether we're going to be like Japan or, or something a lot worse. And what makes life interesting is we don't know how it's going to work out. I think we do know we're flirting with serious trouble. I think we also know that some of our earlier fears were, were overblown. Japan is still existing as a civilized nation in spite of unbelievable excess by all former standards in terms of money printing. Think of how seductive it is. You have a bunch of interest-bearing debts and you pay them off with checking accounts, which you're no longer paying interest. Think of how seductive that is for a bunch of legislators. You get rid of the interest payments and you just, the money supply goes up. It seems like heaven. And of course, when things get that seductive, they're likely to be overused of your, a bunch of options. That frequently happens in human decision making. And the mongers have Berkshire stock, Costco stock, Chinese stock, Su Li Lu, uh, a little bit of Daily Journal stock, and a bunch of apartment houses. Do I think that's perfect? No. Do I think it's okay? Yes. I think the great lesson from the mongers is you don't need all this damn diversification. That's plenty of... You're lucky if you've got four good assets. I think the finance professors and the that sell the idea that perfect diversification is professional investment. If you're trying to do better than average, you're lucky if you have four things to buy. And to ask for 20 is really asking for egg in your beer. It's, it's <laughs> very few people get, get, have enough brains to get 20 good investments. If you're going to invest in stocks for the long term or real estate, of course there are going to be periods when there's a lot of agony and other periods when the, there's a boom. And I think you just have to learn to live through them. And as Kipling said, treat those two imposters just the same. You have to d deal with daylight and night. Does that bother you very much? No. Sometimes it's night and sometimes it's daylight. Sometimes it's a boom, sometimes it's a bust. I'm just, I, I believe in doing as well as you can and keep going as long as they let you easier to predict who flourished in the past because we know what happened in the past, but you now I want to compare what's going to happen in the future. Of course, that's harder. It's very hard for me to imagine. It doesn't mean it couldn't happen, but it's a, I would expect Microsoft and, and Apple and Alphabet to be strong 50 years from now. Really strong, still strong. If you'd asked me when I was young what was going to happen to the department stores that went broke, the newspapers which went broke, and so on, so I wouldn't have predicted that either. So I think it's hard to predict how your world is going to change if you're going to talk about 70, 80, 90 years. Just think, imagine they wiped out the 
shareholders of General Motors. They wiped out the shareholders of Kodak. Who in the hell would have predicted that? This technological change can destroy a lot of people. And and I, it's hard to predict for sure in advance. But the telephone company is still with us. It's just, it just uses a different way of doing it. So some things remain and some vanish. What advice would you give to CEOs seeking to retain their employees? Well, this is a very interesting thing that the pandemic has given us. An awful lot of people have gotten used to not being in the office at five days a week. And I think a lot of those people are never going back to five days a week. It's amazing the percentage of the people in computer science that don't want to be in the office for a normal life. Uh, they want to do a lot of it from locations that are more convenient to them. I think a lot of that's going to remain forever. I, th I don't think we're going back to, I don't think the average corporation is going to fly its directors around so they can sit at the same table for every meeting of the year. Maybe they'll have two meetings where the directors are together. By the way, Berkshire's directors have done that forever. The Berkshire directors have met face to face twice a year forever and done everything else on the telephone or with consent minutes. And it's worked fine for Berkshire. I don't think we needed all these goddamn meetings and airplane flights. So I think part of what's happening is quite constructive that it'll get make life simpler and cheaper and more efficient. I don't think we're going back for some kinds of work. A shareholder named Rob writes in, he says, how do you value Mr. Gensler and the SEC's role in protecting the integrity of the American financial system? Well, it's hard to fix. What happens, of course, is that people rationalize their own way of making a living. There's some moral compromise in most activity that people are in where they make a living, and particularly so in things like finance and wealth management and so forth. And of course, the people making the decisions care more about their own families than they care about the people whose money they're managing, because that's just the way human beings are constructed. And, and that means that when you hire somebody else to manage your money to take care of your old age, it's very hard to get the job done right. It's very difficult. And nowadays, every director in a big company gets $300,000 a year. And everybody thinks we raised all this wonderful independence. A man who needs $300,000 extra a year as a director is not an independent. But one thing you can guarantee is he'll try and stay a director. I don't think that's an ideal system. and. And yet, I don't think there's anything easy to do about it. I just think it's hard to get things managed as well as they should be. I was, in the early days of my life, I was, I worked a little bit on the fringes of the motion picture industry. And I would say practically everyone sort of took advantage of the shareholders. And that was just the culture. And that is just deeply in the human nature that people are going to behave that way. And of course, it makes it makes it hard to run a proper civilization.